Okay, hello people, I'm my fellow socialist. I am uh, Tom Taylor and this is a conversation with a socialist. I'm here with Justin, how do you speak your last name? Uh, Paglino. Paglino, okay. Uh, I, I have trouble sometimes with names either way. It, it could be the simplest of names, I still have trouble with it. Uh, and, you're running, and you say you're running for Congress, right? Yes, U.S. Congress. Uh, I'm on the ballot. I'm the Green Party nominee in the third congressional district of Connecticut. Okay. New Haven uh, and surrounding area. Uh, what inspired you to run for office? Good question. Well, you know, I have been, um, I, I have been a Democrat my whole life and uh, I was a Bernie supporter, um, you know, in uh, 2012 and then again in 2016. And uh, it just got to be very frustrating. You know, there's this divide that's been between the kind of two large factions of the party. And uh, I've always been on the more liberal side of the party. Um, and, you know, there's always been this tension and this, uh, this dilemma among people towards the left who, who, are, who were within, are within the Democratic Party of, are we going to be able to fix this party? Are we going to be able to reform it? Are we going to be able to overcome the, you know, the forces at the top of the party that seem to want to make this a, a corporatist party? Um, some more progressive members have been able to slip in, you know, maybe AOC and, and um, Pramila Jaipal and people with more progressive ideas have been able to, to succeed in, in some areas. But generally speaking, in the party, you're facing a very uphill battle. And, um, you know, I just got, I just became convinced that the only way to put any real pressure on the system is to walk away and um, I just gave up on the party and I just came to the conclusion that electoral pressure where you show that you're willing to vote for what you want is the, really the only way to put actual pressure um, to, change, to change things, to change the system. So I've thought a lot about this, about the two party system and how it's led to a, uh, a lowering of the bar where people are voting for the lesser of evil when you vote for the lesser of two evils, you're voting, you're still voting for evil. So it lowers the bar. And I think over time, it explains why um, our candidates have gotten more evil, so to speak. I mean, um, you, when people vote for the lesser evil, they're voting against sometimes their own self-interest, if not at least their own principles. Mm -hmm. But many times, you know, if, if you're being asked, if, you know, the Democrats are asking someone without health insurance to vote for Joe Biden or to vote for Democrats, you know, you're asking somebody to vote against maybe their own medical needs. And it's really asking too much. Um, so I just, I, I listened to a lot of Jimmy Dore and I, I read Listen Liberal by Thomas Frank. And those were both, and I listened to a lot of what um, Howie Hawkins had to say about the need for an independent left that votes left mm -hmm. and uh, altogether it just had a tremendous influence on me and when I came to learn about ranked choice voting where we have a way of reforming the way we vote so that there is no spoiler effect and we don't even have to to worry about um, throwing away your vote or splitting the vote so to speak um, as they have now in Maine I said hey this is the way forward we need more than two parties and ranked choice voting, I believe, is the way we can get there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, when I, I when I read uh, earlier today, or maybe it was last night. I know it was, it was last night. That Maine had decided to uh, use the presidential uh, election as a ranked choice. My first thought is, okay, experimenting with it to see how it goes, see who wins, that kind of thing. And I, I think that every state should be like that since we do actually have, technically we have what, four parties that are um, recognized by the FEC as, um, as parties, right? The political parties, you have the Libertarians, Green Party, Democrats, and Republicans, right? Oh, I'm sorry, and also the Socialist Alternative. So okay, I'm not sure how many are on the list for the FEC, but yeah. No, I'm, I'm referring to like people that who have brand as 
Like you have someone in Seattle who ran as a social alternative, won under that ticket. So they were, they, they were effectively recognized as an actual political party because of that part, I think. And she's like the, the most, uh, she's kind of the, the face of, of, the, of the SA, the not one. Um, Howie Hoffman's obviously the Green Party, but. Yeah, there's a lot of parties that are, uh, but you know, the fact is it's very hard for any third party um, because of the way we have first past the post voting the, the fact that we run our elections this way, there's something called Duverger's Law, D-U-V-E-R-G-E-R, -E yeah. which is, um, you know, a, an academic uh, uh, prop, uh, kind of prophecy that if you have first passed the post voting, you will winnow the number of parties down to two over time because it's just unsustainable. If you want to have like a, a without ranked choice voting, if you want to have, say, five parties on the ticket, it creates a problem uh, because, you know, somebody could win with 20% of the vote. Mm -hmm. And everybody else kind of quickly figures out, oh, you know, this isn't good. We, this doesn't work. We have, to, we have to get things down, narrow things down to two and then decide. So that's kind of Duverger's law. Yeah. So it's, we don't have a law against third parties, you know, we, but we say we have a two-party system, but the only, the real mechanism that enforces that two-party system, to me, is the absence of ranked choice voting. Yeah, so, it's not only that, but it's the incumbents of the two parties that write laws uh, at that moment, because the, those laws then get rejected by the, that state Supreme Court eventually, but after the deal is done and the election cycle is over. That's what happened with, um, what's her face? Um, oh, Camp, uh, Camp won, won the, uh, the uh, governor's race uh, versus, uh, I forget what her name is, but uh, the African American. Um, oh, uh, Stacey Abrams? Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, he won based on the fact that he was the official that controlled the election. Right. So uh, he, right. they purged so many African Americans or just people in general that were of the Democratic Party that he won, but then he got, but then he then lost his seat and that go, go around anyway. So. He, yeah, he, yeah, there's a lot of that that goes on that the election systems are run by Democrats or Republicans, usually are the secretaries of state and you know, they have a certain amount of uh, integrity, hopefully, but you know, there's, there's how much, how much of that is really enforceable? I mean, how the system, you know, and then also with redistricting, you know, that whatever party is in power after the census every 10 years gets to draw, redraw the district lines in a way that's favorable to their party. So you know, we do need some kind of more objective and less partisan means of, of, um, of running elections. And they, and they, the parties do make things hard for third, the major parties do make things for hard for third parties. I and mean, we saw the, the uh, Democrats sue to get the Greens off the ballot in Wisconsin, get the Greens off the ballot in Pennsylvania. Yeah, when I, when I saw that and I, I, uh, I uh, listened to the, uh, the, the Q&A that, that, that Andrew Walker and Howie Hawkins used to have, they went over that and it was over a address because she had moved during that petition, uh, uh, getting petitions done during that time. She had moved like four miles or something like that away from where she had originally uh, registered. And if now, am I wrong in thinking that they had, they had um, I, at least a few months in order to get that uh, established as far as like her paperwork and all that stuff? And the two party, the two parties that were uh, on that election commission to uh, to allow for ballot access, um, they took months to figure this out and still deadlocked and went went to the court and the court decided that no, this is not good. Yeah, I I I don't know all the details of the of the of the case, but I think what it boils down to is, you know, they got them kicked off on a technicality. And they'll go to any length. I mean, I there's another case where they got a green off the ballot, the Green Party off the ballot. I 
think it was in Montana. Yeah. Where they actually, the Democrats actually hired people to go to pe go knock on doors to people who had signed the petition mm -hmm. to put the Green Party on the ballot and try to get them to recant. So we'll say, will you, will you please like, you know, revoke your signature from the petition? And they got enough people, did you hear about that? And they got enough people to do it. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I know how much work goes into trying to get on the ballot. You know, I had to get over 2000 signatures mm -hmm. to get on the ballot. And maybe it didn't sound like much to me, but I'd never done it before. I didn't realize how much work it was going to be. Yeah. Because getting signatures, I mean, especially this year with no public gatherings, you can't, you know, I, I, I ended up spending a lot of time in hot parking lots, sometimes getting kicked out. Um, but there's nowhere else to go. Yeah. Yeah. To, to find people. And you can get maybe, you know, maybe uh, 10 signatures an hour. Um, 20 at a farmer's market or something but you know otherwise you know you're looking at like 200 man hours of work 200 man or woman hours or what have you of, of work yeah i i i found it uh so critical that the courts allowed the democrats and republicans both as far as registered voters and just in uh, different things on the ballot uh, they allowed them to get those online and not have to force them to go in person we say that again. I'm sorry, you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I, I said that the de that the courts allow the Democrats and Republicans to do signatures online in order to get like ballot access and all that stuff. But yet they had, but yet they forced the Green Party to go in person in a lot of states to get those same signatures. And Madeline Hoffman in New Jersey had to do the same thing. It wasn't very yeah. many in, 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 uh, in comparison, but it was, it was still a lot of signatures they had to get. Yeah. So. But here's where I come down on all this is, is, uh, you know, they're making enemies by doing all this and, and we can complain about it. Um, but what happens next? I mean, to me, you know, this has been going on a long time and what we need to do to, to change the game, we need more people to show that they're willing to walk away and vote for an independent left and yeah. that'll make the left stronger. Uh, but I think we can get more people to do that with ranked choice voting mm -hmm. because we can tell them, hey, now you can rank us first. You can rank first the, the candidate that you really like the best mm -hmm. and you can rank, uh, you know, the lesser evil second and not worry about tipping the election. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to do both at the same time. I think in, uh, we have to, you know, vote for, for an independent left because that also puts pressure on to get ranked choice voting. Because yeah. eventually the Democrats will say, hey, we're losing so many people. Sorry, that's my Roomba. No problem. <laughs> um, there's, you know, eventually they'll, they'll re if, we, if, they, if we siphon enough, if we get enough votes uh, and show the Democrats we're a force to be reckoned with, eventually they'll say, okay, well, maybe this ranked choice voting thing isn't so bad after all because if we can't be your first choice, a voter's first choice, maybe we can be their second choice. And maybe then they'll get behind it. Mm -hmm. um, in Maine, it had to be passed by voter referendum. They're going to have a referendum in Massachusetts mm -hmm. this, this year. They're having one issue too, and I hope they get it too. Yeah. I'm really excited about ranked choice voting. I think it's going to be the end of, you know, we've suffered a lot um, through a lot of fights that that we've only had to have because of the spoiler effect and yeah you now who knew i didn't know there was an easy solution sitting there the whole time that you know ireland and australia have been using for for decades and well, whatnot in other countries well that, that's the thing other countries have had the, the exact same thing that we don't have for years ring toys voting then you know, they also have medicare for all type system they also have free college or low, low income uh tuition they have pretty much everything that we're inspiring to have right now and we are because of the money of politics uh that gives the lawmakers right now who are in there right now incentive to keep it off and keep it off as law and i just learned that we actually do have a law that uh, allows the government to, to write off uh, the uh, student loan debt 
They just don't do it because they actually get money based off of it. Mm -hmm. Because of the interest. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, are you talking, you're talking about like the corruption of the political system? Uh, I'm, I'm referring to, uh, th there's a law that was passed in the 60s, I think I just learned about that. Uh, it, it was it was kind of like the uh, according to like the the New Deal or something like that that allowed uh, students to or the government to write off the uh, the debts at, at its entirety, but they but they haven't done that because they have, because they get dividends off of the student loans. And it's kind of like a bank in that way. Huh. Okay, because oh yeah, so that are you talking about loans from the government to the students? Yeah, yeah, student loans that they can write. Yeah they can uh, forgive at any moment. It, 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 is an, it is an actual law that's on the books. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the, when it comes to student loans and, and the power of Wall Street and the big banks, um, you know, I was also really inspired by the Occupy Wall Street movement. We went down there and it was really beautiful to see. Um, they had one in New Haven that I visited, you know, and uh, the Democrats again here have let us down, you know, in 1998, they um, deregulated Wall Street. They repealed Glass-Steagall, which was a, a Depression era law that separated investment banking from commercial banking and was meant to, sorry about that, and was meant to protect consumers and to rein in, you know, um, kind of reckless speculation on Wall Street and stop yeah. it from being a casino. And I think it was Russ Feingold who said on the floor of the of the Congress when they passed this, and that was under Clinton. Yes, yeah. You know, uh, he said, I think we're going to regret this in 10 years when we see that um, what happens to Wall Street 10 years from now. And he called it exactly, it was 10 years later that there was the financial catastrophe. Well, what also started the whole thing was uh, a friend of Elizabeth Warren who was teaching uh, uh, economy or economics at that time. I, I'm not sure where, but uh, she, she said at one point in time that she was. She uh, she taught Clinton how you know, what, what taxes were about and all this stuff, and that's where Clinton uh, went to her husband and got him to actually sign up on the repeal of Glass Steagall. So mm -hmm. the whole thing started with Elizabeth Warren teaching Clinton how to do it. Really? That that that's what uh, I think it might be on YouTube, but Elizabeth yeah. Warren, I think said in like in the '80s on a talk show that Clinton came up to her to ask her her advice about that. Oh yeah. So it was actually Warren that taught her how to do this. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the, this gets into like, are there good Democrats? Are there, I mean, we know there's a lot of bad Democrats, you know, and then like, who can you trust? You know, a lot of people trusted Obama or thought he talked a really good game. He seemed to be different. He, he's, when he, he was able to elaborate values that seemed to really, um, you know, resonate with a lot of us, but then he picks, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs people to run the treasury and so on and so on. Um, there are some, there are some good Democrats. And I think, I think, you know, they are able to sometimes win in certain primaries. Um, you know, Russ Feingold, you know, he was on the right side of that issue, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, that's saying something for him. Um, but, but, you know, the party as a whole seems to just from the top down, has seen, there seems to be pressure to be a corporate party and and uh, placate the donors, um, okay. and that's it's their business model, and I just didn't want to be a part of that anymore. And it's it's um, you know it's it's not it's not what we need. It's it's not the change we need, mm -hmm. uh, and we're just not going to get what we need from the Democrats. I don't oppose people for wanting to try and reform from within, but I just think we need pressure from without as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now I, I, uh, I saw an interview you did with uh, Ron McClone uh, a couple of days ago or so. And you, and uh, I, I remember you mentioned, um, uh, what was it? Um, the, the, it was a different name for the ranked choice voting that, that, that you mentioned earlier. I just, I, I, just, I blanked on what, what you called it. Um, but uh, did you say in that interview that you're a physician? I'm an MD, PhD. Okay, I'm not so, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. What? I'm not, I'm not really sure what that is. <laughs> oh, so I went to med school and then I did, um, that was four years, and then I did two years of training in laboratory medicine, which is like 
um, the, working in the, the testing labs, really like the hematology, chemistry, blood bank, immunology, kind of learning about clinical laboratory testing in medicine and understanding the tests so that you can kind of be an expert in those and, and consult with physicians who want to understand the meaning of the results and so on. Uh, but I was always kind of drawn towards research. So after those two years, I went in and did a PhD, which was five years in a research lab in virology. Mm -hmm. And then I stuck with it. I, I kind of, I, I went in that direction. I decided I wanted to go into research. And then I did another 10 years after the la after getting my PhD in a different lab, but also working with viruses that infect cancers. So my interest was in viruses that infect cancers as a potential treatment for cancer. And I, I had a pretty good run. I mean, I got, I got a five-year grant from the National Cancer Institute mm -hmm. to fund my research for five years and my salary and my supplies and everything. Mm -hmm. and, and that was great. Um, and it was my own ideas that got funded. But, um, you know, the data didn't turn out great. And, uh, you know, if you can't generate publications from your from your work uh, it's hard to move forward yeah. in research just the the way it is mm. uh, so it was frustrating but um, I decided to turn towards a different kind of career in music uh, recently I've you know been teaching piano and um, and performing in some bands and mm. uh, I'm you know I'm fortunate that I'm able to do that because it is lower income but um, you know, but yes, that's my background. I think my science background is useful and my medical background is useful um, because I, you know, I think I learned to think, try to think objectively when you look at a problem, try to be aware of your own biases. That's what science is all about is try to be aware of your own biases and how they might be affecting your judgment mm -hmm. and try to look at um, what, what the evidence is to support this or that idea, or this or that solution. Mm -hmm. you know, what do we know about, has it been tried and what was the uh, result? Hmm. Uh, well, could you um, uh, let people know how to uh, donate to you as Double Nature? As what? Uh, can you uh, elaborate where people could donate to your campaign, uh, how they yeah. can volunteer online or? Oh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So uh, thanks to the viewers and listeners, I am at justinforall.org. Um, and uh, it's like the number four, justinforall.org. And there you can find a place to donate or to volunteer um, or sign up for the newsletter. Uh, or if you live in the third district, um, request a yard sign that you know we can deliver to you. That We have yard signs. These are they behind me. Mm. And, uh, you know, and I post, I post uh, blog posts and I'm going to try to put up media appearances like this. I'm trying to get, get these on the website too. Um, uh, I have somebody working for me to help help me get the the website um, the way I want it looking. He's done a good job, but we're still developing it. Mm -hmm. So, but that's it, justinforall.org. Okay. Now, I was asking about the medical part because I remember uh, also seeing that the, the conversation we're having with uh, Ron, uh, I say that as by another guy. Uh, <laughs> you know Ron? No, I don't. No, oh, yeah. That's that's nice. Funny. I don't really know him either. As if I know him. Uh, no, I was. Uh, I, I noticed that you were talking about Medicare for all, and uh, I was. Gonna, I, I wanted to ask you since I thought you may, may, be, may be a physician, but you do have uh, you do have experience in that kind of the field. Uh, would you happen to know um, what the implications are to if we were able to get Medicare for all implemented at a hundred percent and. Uh, would would um, how would the let's say private physicians uh, be affected by it? Uh, publicly paid uh, physicians be affected by it? Stuff of that nature. Kind of clarify that because I uh, I feel that it's not been clarified to the point where people understand and no no longer can question. Well, basically, you know, Medicare for all is a single payer system where. Um, you know, Uncle Sam would pay everyone's medical bills. It's basically what it boils down to. Um, doctors would, uh, for doctors, the only change is uh, where they send their their bills. Instead of sending things to the patient's private insurance company, they send everything to the same address. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it basically all goes to the same program, Medicare for all. 
mm-hmm. and then the bills get paid uh, by Medicare for all. So um, they, this would be a, a system that's responsive to democracy. Is one of the things I like about it. Uh, you know, free market forces don't create a good outcome when it comes to health insurance, because you know, the there's it's not just it's the profit motive, and also they you know so they they companies have been incentivized to do things like deny healthcare to people with pre-existing conditions, yeah. you know, which is why, you know, the one, one of the good things about Obamacare, it didn't go far enough, but one of the good things was that it said, no, you can't do that. You have to at least sell insurance to people with pre-existing conditions, but they can still charge a lot, you know, an arm and a leg for it. Um, so health course, healthcare is still unaffordable for a huge number, uh, far too many people about, one in 10 are uninsured and of the insured about one in three are underinsured, meaning uh, they still can't, um, it's still cost prohibitive for, for them to get all the medical care that they want. Mm-hmm. Um, and even the two thirds that are cons- considered adequately insured, um, uh, one in five of those report delaying care because of concerns about cost. Mm-hmm. So the implications of Medicare for all are that everybody would get comprehensive health coverage and we'd be, um, you know, the, the benefits would, would there be a ripple effect of benefits uh, when you have a healthier uh, society. Um, from the per- perspective of physicians, um, I really don't think that the reimbursement drop would be as, as, as serious as, they, uh, as some physicians fear, which is why most physicians now support Medicare for all, or at least about half when they survey like the members of the American Medical Association. So, um, because a lot of the savings just come from taking out the profit motive, being more efficient, efficiencies of scale. And uh, that's, and so this is the other point that I make is that it's actually cheaper, right? Uh, it, Medicare for all would save money. Mm-hmm. It's actually uh, up, to 20, up to 15% cheaper or 500 billion a year, billion dollars a year cheaper than our current system. It's just that you know you're paying to a different person, but it's still less money. You know that people <laughs> worry about um, taxes. Well, we could fund it on a sliding scale. That's how I'd like to see it. I'm a big believer in progressive taxation. Mm-hmm. I actually payroll taxes. I'm not sure I like them at all because um, they seem like a regressive tax, and. Uh, you know, I don't know what's wrong with just funding everything with a progressive income tax, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, that would have to be negotiated. But I just think that, you know, there's a lot of strong arguments for Medicare for all, which is why now it's supported by, um, you know, 80% or higher of Democrats. Uh, and my, but my representative is not one of them. Mm-hmm. So despite being a Democrat, she's in a minority of, of her own party. So this is why I'm running. Because mm-hmm. if people want to support Medicare for all, they, they need a candidate on the ballot who supports it so that they can vote for it. Yeah. And that's my camp. That's become my campaign slogan. If you want something, you have to vote for it. Yeah. And so if, if I, if somebody like me wasn't on the ballot, no, you People who want Medicare for all, they can't even express that at the ballot box, which means you can't put any real pressure on the system to get Medicare for all. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't vote for it, uh, you know, you, it just won't happen. There's not, there's not going to be the pressure to make it happen. Yeah, uh, I actually, if memory serves me, Lawrence O'Donnell, uh, one time I think on, on a uh, on a um, documentary said that uh, unless uh, people are willing to vote uh, against the Tea Party system. Will they be uh, will they be forced to look at what they're not doing and start doing it and start enacting those types of uh, policies? Yeah, I mean, if you keep voting for the same two parties, you're going to keep getting the same two parties. It's like that joke, you know, like, do you want ants? Because that's how you get ants mm-hmm. um, or from Zoolander or something. But, you know, yeah, if you want more than two parties, you have to vote for a different party than than the two that we have. Yeah. And, but I think the people worry about the spoiler effect. And I think, I think there's no reason to deny that it's a real effect, a real thing. I mean, some people uh, kind of balk and say, well, you know, I mean, but look, the, the, the problem is really Duverger's law. 
it's not that the third parties haven't tried hard enough. I mean, the movement for People's Party, I wish them luck, but they're going to face the same uh, mechanistic hurdle that any third party is, every third party has faced, mm -hmm. which is Duverger's Law. And so until we get ranked choice voting, I really think we're going to be kind of stuck in this toxic two-party system. But the good news is I think ranked choice voting is catching on. People are learning about it. Um, part of why I'm really happy about being able to do what I'm doing is I'm getting to kind of spread the word about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I think it's really going to change a lot of things for the better. You know, the Democrats, instead of trying to shame people into voting for them and voter shaming, they can say what they'll try to appeal to you and try and get your second choice rank, you know? Uh, it, so it becomes more uh, um, uh, positive dynamics in campaigning and uh, less about kind of trying to scare people into voting for you. Yeah. Well, I think we're we are actually a little bit past the time that you, that, that you had uh, set aside due to your uh, other uh, uh, obligations. So, um, uh, thank you for being on. Remember, and I'm talking to people obviously. Uh, remember, if you want to hear this or see this interview early, uh, become a member on my podcast Anchor.fm/slash Combo and Socialism. You go to his website. Uh, uh, what was the website again? Justinforall.org. And to donate, volunteer, and help in any way you can. Thanks for being here. Uh, I wish you luck on your campaign, and I'll um, I will get to done another month and see how things are going. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day.